sure many of you do not know who I am. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Hogan. Um, Khan and I were brothers, and uh, I usually refer to him, uh, have to refer to him as my big brother because he never liked to be called my older brother. And so uh, I'll just say he was my brother today. Um, I'm a uh, trustee here at the, at the college, and I have really the pleasure to um, welcome each and every one of you to this uh, ceremony or celebration of this. And um, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the administration of the BCFA, uh, I welcome all of you. Um, you know, it's this award ceremony has been a, um, a tradition here at the college really f from the beginning. And, and it's really good now that we are doing this in person because it, it means a lot. Um, I always think that of, of the first award, which was held over in the Alumnex Hall, and uh, how excited Khan was about the, f the, f the actual first award, I think it was 2015. And he was there and his family was there, and of course his family is here today. And um, he was really impressed with all the people that showed up. And uh, I remember telling him, I said, well, you know, I suspected a lot of those people were there for him and uh, to celebrate his achievements and all he has, had, has given to the state of Vermont and the people in the state of Vermont. Uh, and I remember at his, his talk, he, was, uh, he spoke about the importance of good governance, public service, and community service. And, uh, which were really his passions. The, uh, and all the recipients of this award over these past few years uh, have all been outstanding people who have made immense contributions uh, which support the values that uh, Khan has e exhibited during his life publicly and personally, I can assure you. And uh, this year's winner, uh, Joe Weah, is no different. And I really think if Con were here today, the two of them would become fast friends based upon what I know of, of this award for today. So um, in, welcome again and enjoy the program. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Will Bologna who is a member of the Hogan Award Committee and Executive Director of the Vermont Community Loan Fund. And uh, he's our MC for today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I've got to put my glasses on as I age. I realize I can't read what I write anymore. Um, but thank you all for coming. and. Uh, you know, we did this last in person, this award, uh, in 2019. And since then, in 2020, 2021, it was, it was all virtual. Um, and this is our, we're, we're back in person, although, uh, so one, welcome. And two, we do our, we also do have folks virtually listening and watching in on our YouTube, ch YouTube channel. So welcome all you who are uh, out in the, uh, out in, in, you know, wherever you are and, and listening and watching in. Uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time, everyone taking the time to be here tonight. So, you know, again, welcome everyone to the presentation ceremony of the 2022 Con Hogan Award for Creative, Entrepreneurial, and Community Leadership. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm Will Belanger. I'm a member of the Con Hogan Award Committee. Uh, executive director of the Vermont Community Loan Fund. And um, I first do, even though they, they just stepped out, um, I do want to thank um, our musicians, Pam Bacchus and Leeds Brewer, for providing the music for the ceremony. And let's give them all a, a welcome and a thank you. Uh, before we move into the content, um, as I mentioned, uh, we're in person tonight. We're also on the YouTube. 
uh, live stream. And I want to thank our, our partners at CCTV who are handling the technology for tonight. Um, the live stream will be available online uh, through the Vermont Community Foundation's website uh, for those that want to go back and listen and watch. So the late Con Hogan was, you know, an important figure in Vermont. Uh, from his work in the public, nonprofit, and private for-profit sectors, he exemplified the kind of uh, thinking and leadership that Vermont needs as we address the challenges of this century. Con's down-to-earth management approach was always backed by both sophisticated, tested theory and, and nuts and bolts practicality. Um, he used data to uh, think through possible solutions to problems, used data and, uh, and information from partners and community members to come to practical but also innovative solutions to those problems. The Con Hogan Award was created in 2015 as a way of recognizing the contributions made by Con to the state of Vermont by encouraging and rewarding leaders who share his vision of Vermont that places the highest value on the public good and to demonstrate his leadership qualities in achieving uh, results for Vermont. And this year, we are pleased to present this award to Joe Wea. Refugee Resettlement Director of the Ethiopian Community Development Council's Multicultural Community Center in Brattleboro. Joe, congratulations. <laughs> uh, and before we move on, I want to uh, call attention to two groups um, uh, that are here today. And first is the Con Hogan Award Committee, which oversees this program. And I'm going to um, just call out their names and you can just wave your hands or stand up, really your choice. First we have Paul Sillo, Public Assets Institute, Paul. Steve, D and you can, why don't we just hold, we'll hold our applause, we'll do it all at the end once we get through, uh, one th through the whole board. Uh, Steve Dale, former Human Services Manager, Steve. Scott Johnson, Chair of the, he's our chair, has been our chair for a number of years and keeps us all in line, that's great. Uh, Ellen Kaler from the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and Jane Kimball from the Vermont Community Foundation. Dr. Eitan Nasreddin Longo from the Vermont State Police. Jericho Parms from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. Jericho is helping us uh, a lot with some of our, what you will see, some of our IT issues. Uh, and then Reverend Arnold Isidore Thomas, pastor of the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church of Jericho. And Diane Wally from the Wyndham Southeast Supervisory Union. And then myself. So let's give the, the committee a round of applause. And I, and I want to, you know, personally, I want to thank the committee for their work and, the, and really the stewardship of this award for the, for the past seven years, uh, and probably a little longer as they had to think it through before they made that first award, and that probably took some time. Um, next, the next group I really want to uh, thank and acknowledge um, are the award recipients of the Con Hogan Award from the previous seven years. Um, and, and they are, we get to repeat, Ellen Kaler from the Sustainable Jobs Fund, Michael Monty from the Champlain Housing Trust. Holly Morehouse, Vermont After School, currently with the Vermont Community Foundation. James Baker, criminal justice consultant and former commissioner of corrections. Jan DeMars, currently the statewide coordinator of the Community Action Agencies of Vermont. The Vermont Department of Health as a whole institution who really stepped up for all of us during the health crisis and the pandemic that we had and that we're still having. And then Dr. Lydia Clemens from the Clemens Family Farm, our most recent awardee last year. So let's give them all a round of applause. So I'm going to just introduce two people at once. I'm going to have them one come up one at a time to um, give some reflections on Khan. Uh, and the importance that he had on this, this state 
and on all of us. And um, the two folks are uh, Neil Hogan uh, and then Karen Hine. And they're going to share their reflections as his son and colleague, respectively. Um, and before I, I'll just kind of give a, a brief on them, and then I'll have Neil come up first, and then Karen next. Neil, Khan's son, he serves as the vice president of the New England Chimney Supply. And then Dr. Karen Hine was a founding member of the Khan Hogan Award Committee and a colleague of Khan's as a member of the Green Mountain Care Board. So, Neil, why don't you come first? And then when he's done, Karen, if you could come up. Well, hello, hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Cornelius Duggan Hogan III, Con's son, better known as Neil. Uh, sharing a unique name uh, like that has always generated a lot of interesting interactions with people who knew my father but not me. Uh, for instance, uh, using my credit card once at a local store, uh, the cashier looked at me, looked at my card, and said, you're not the Con Hogan I know. <laughs> so, um, I want to thank you all for being here tonight, uh, especially Joe Walsh for your accomplishments. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, the, the college. Uh, they've always done an amazing job for hosting these kinds of events, especially in his honor. And uh, I'm sure Dad would have been very happy and overwhelmed with the incredible amount of support, gratitude, and love that has poured in over the years uh, surrounding this award and the people who have been honored. I am also grateful for it, and I know my family is as well. Um, when I was asked to give a talk tonight, I thought I would grab uh, a thought from thin air and talk about Dad and his data and the data decision-making and just run with it. However, finding that right thought or story for such an event is always uh, proven difficult. Uh, there is so much to say about a man that can cast such a large shadow and who has touched the lives of so many people in so many different venues. It can be difficult to find the right one. When there is only one person on this earth that knows him as a husband for 53 years, only two people that call him a father, only two more people that call him pop-up, it may be easy to think that we have a unique perspective of him that many people do not have. Which to a point, of course, is true. But the more people I have conversations with and the more general experiences I have with people that knew him from a work experience and perspective, I'm not so sure that the unique perspective of him is all that unique. Because it's through these conversations becomes the realization that he lived his family life with the same set of values and the same set of decision-making tools that he lived in his professional life. It's only the stories and experiences that change between the two. So I do have many thoughts and stories to share about Dad, but there are two really that stand out to me that would directly relate to an event such as this evening's. Memories of circumstances that are teachable moments that put my sister and myself on the right path. The first is family related. My sister and I were very fortunate to grow up on a family horse farm. Sounds like fun and games, I know. But taking care of large animals, training, feeding, mucking stalls, fixing the barn, fixing other things, and literally lifting thousands of hay bales each year is a very good way to develop a very robust work ethic. The rewards of that hard work were many weekends of traveling to compete around the state, around New England, and sometimes beyond. When I was about 14 years old, I grew about six inches in about four months. My pants didn't fit, my shoes didn't fit, and my horse Victor didn't fit. So we started to search for a new one. We found a big bay at a farm on the outskirts of Essex, who was nice, but not a good fit for me, and we passed. However, Ruth, who was always along for a good horse trip, was in love. In the coming days afterwards, Ruth wrote a four-page essay, which I believe she still has, filled with data and reasoning, backed up with more data and more reasoning, about why a horse named Valentino would be the perfect fit for her, and presented it to Dad 
with all of the passion that a 17-year-old could have. Even though that particular horse hunting trip was not originally meant for her, Ruth's four-page essay filled with her ideas, facts, numbers, Dad took that and he fed that passion. And they came to an agreement financially and they came to an agreement with responsibility and some other things that I'm sure I'm not aware of. But the thing is, he understood what it's like to feed somebody with their passion. And that's where it all came from. Valentino became a very big milestone for her professional equestrian career. Now at the time, my 14-year-old brain actually took that lesson as never underestimate a teenager girl with a book full of data. <laughs> so for the second example that I have, uh, which is work-related for him, let me put an image into your minds first. When Dad retired from the state of Vermont the first time around, when he was the Secretary of Human Services, there was a reception with all of his colleagues from that department. And all of the other important people in his life were there. Some of his colleagues at that time put together a video parody skit of what it was like to work with Con Hogan. And this really stuck with me because I recall a scene with two or three people coming out of his office from this fictitious meeting that revealed the clothes on them had been torn, torn to shreds. So keep this image in mind because your thoughts of that may change in a moment. On the surface, that really seems like a very brutal idea to show at a retirement party, but I'm willing to bet there was not a single person that ever knew him that didn't understand that parody. I remember thinking to myself when I saw that, oh man, I know exactly how that is. Because looking closer at those people coming out of that fictitious meeting, they were all smiling. They were as happy as could be, even with the ripped shirts. The comments that were said as they came out is, I think that went very well. And yes, it did. It was really a tribute to a man who expected thoughtful results. Thoughtful results with compassion and thoughtful results that had been backed up with real world numbers. Those happy people believed in a man that through sheer hard work would help them down the right road to find the answers that they were all looking for, even if it meant having a few difficult moments along the way. I knew exactly how those people felt inside, and I knew exactly how they felt about him. Dad was a creator, and a humble one at that, not just a participant. Whatever the subject was at hand, his ideas and creations were based on facts and figures and data to get things started, common sense mixed with morality to keep things moving, ending up with a lesson learned, sometimes a hard one if need be, and finally accountability. That's how his stories were created, and that's the way it was at home. Although I never professionally worked with Dad, I'm absolutely positive that's the way he ran his work life as well. Mom and Dad raised two children, put them both on the right path. Both of those children teach, coach, volunteer, mentor, lead, and are part of their communities. And they are both successful in their chosen careers. As a direct result of that, he also has two incredible granddaughters that are also on that same path, whom he loved very dearly. Those two granddaughters are also in the habit of writing their own essays to get what they need. So tonight's recognition is, of Joe is really a continuation of dad's home and way uh, of home and work way of life. To find those who have made a difference in their communities through their passions, hard work, decision making through data, I would like to personally congratulate you, Joe, on your accomplishments. And I know my father would have been proud to have known you. Reading your story uh, is heartbreaking and inspiring all in the same breath. And we all thank you for making Vermont a better place. Thank you. Hi, everyone. If there is one word that summarizes Con Hogan, it is big. Big intellect, 
big heart, big body, big influence, and huge soul. Khan and I became soul mates when we served together a decade ago as founding members of the Green Mountain Care Board overseeing Vermont's awesome, very visionary health reform law. Although I had had my home in southern Vermont for half a century, I had actually never been to Montpelier. As we waited, uh, the first slide please, one back. As we waited for the press conference where the governor then, it was Peter Shumlin, would introduce us to the public, we were all pretty nervous. The guys were straightening their ties and the women were sort of standing up straight as tall as we could as the weight of the responsibility of enacting the comprehensive visionary law dawned on us. In that seemingly endless moment, Khan cracked a joke and that's why we're all smiling. Next slide. Our offices were near each other and we spent hours together every day, especially first thing in the morning. We began by figuring out whom we knew in common. Since we both had history of a focus on youth development, we quickly realized that we had met each other through jail. Not everyone can say or would even admit that on their first meeting, but we were thrilled to have this particular connection. In the early 70s, Khan had actually worked in the New Jersey Corrections Department, but then he became commissioner of Vermont's prison system, the Correction Department, while I was medical director in the Bronx of New York City's Jail for Kids, the infamous Spofford Juvenile Center. We were both dedicated to trying to not reform the kids or the adults, but reform the system to correct the correction system. And that was something that actually uh, we had in common, was to try to change the societal view of young people from, as it was at that time, thought of as the source of problems to the resource to solve problems. So, Khan continued to focus in this positive framing of young people throughout his career, including his time as Vermont's Secretary of the Agency for Human Services, as well as through participation in various boards and groups and teams all around the country and actually all around the world, especially in Ireland. And it was these set of thriving indicators, not surviving, but thriving, that some of you on the selection committee actually worked on as well those indicators became the outcome measures, our first things that the Green Mountain Care Board said we were accountable for providing for Vermonters. In a sense, not just to have health care accessible and to save money, but those thriving indicators that Khan and you developed were how we would measure our success. Khan had the grand vision in mind for the Green Mountain Care Board. He thought that um, that he was determined to follow through with the promise that he made that healthcare was a human right and to make it affordable and effective. I too was a sort of think big person, but Khan always had the data, the plan, and the experience to figure out how we could actually connect the dots and actually get to the grand vision. When various groups would come in to lobby us, the Green Mountain Care Board, on every um, imaginable issue, Khan would say, where is the evidence that what you want us to do would actually help improve health and save Vermonters money? In that way, he brought people into the process of regulating and planning health care, making them think through the consequences and unintended consequences of their ideas and actions. Khan was a vision guy, but as you heard from Neil, he was a data guy. He could pour over pages of numbers and budgets and projections and just love, he just loved numbers. But what's the amazing thing was he could step back and extract the meaning from those columns and tables and projections as if the words were simply written across the page. It was really quite remarkable and amazing to me and to many, many people. He could be jolly, but don't ever try to pull one over on Con Hogan. He saw through bluff and he didn't tolerate pomposity or conceit. 
I'm a sort of reductionist when it comes to complexity. I drew a one-pager for myself that summarized all the regulatory, investigative, oversight, and innovative responsibilities of the Green Mountain Care Board and how they fit together to improve health and reduce cost. I presented it to our group, to the staff and board, hoping it would help them get their arms around what we had to do in the coming months and years. Most of them simply put it on their pile, which were very high in their office, or filed it in the circular file for recycled paper. But not Khan. Khan put it right in the center of his bulletin board and referred to it as the plan. But the irony about the difference between Khan and me was I had a, no trouble writing the one pager, but it was Khan who knew and understood the various parts on that piece of paper of the plan and knew how to, not only to make them work, but how to make them work together to get to those thriving outcomes. Khan's big intellect. Being new to Montpelier, my husband Ralph and I didn't have any friends here. The second month after arrival in the fall of 2011, Ralph was diagnosed with progressive dementia. We were able to enroll him in an adult day program in Barrie. So we each had our place to be during the day. And during the day, I was spending all my time with Khan. We felt Khan's big heart when he invited us to the farm to meet Jeanette and to be with the horses. The magnificence of that farm in Plainfield but it wasn't just a one-time invitation. Ralph and I returned many times to sit on their couch to be the audience for their rehearsals for their country music, the Cold Country Bluegrass Band, with Khan strumming on his banjo and with Jeanette playing her stand-up bass and singing beautifully together their voices and their lives expressed in such exuberance and harmony. We followed them in their performances to gazebos and fields all over Vermont. They're wonderful, filling the air and our hearts with their down-home music, good cheer, and always a well-told, well-timed joke to keep us all feeling mighty fine. Khan would have adored knowing Joe Wea. They are both men of principle, of dedication to improving the lives of others. They both have a worldview that encompasses all people and a view of Vermont that envisions a more diverse, inclusive population in our brave little state. A more diverse and, and, and more inclusive, think about that and what Khan's vision was and what Joe is now making come true. I know that Khan is smiling his biggest smile to see Joe Wea receiving this year's award in his name. Khan brought us to this point. Joe will lead us forward. You are with us, Khan Hogan. Your big intellect, your big heart, your big body, your big influence, and your oh so huge soul. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Neil. Uh, that's wonderful. The, we're gonna we're gonna move uh, actually to a, a virtual little portion. Um, we are the committee is delighted now to have Dr. Lydia Clemens share some remarks and her reflections on being the 2021 Con Hogan Award winner. I hope you are all doing well and staying healthy. I am so sorry that I can't be with you in person today in Montpelier. And so I want to thank the Con Hogan Award Committee for their graciousness in giving me this opportunity to spend some time with you virtually and to share some thoughts as last year's recipient of the Con Hogan Award. For many years now, I've been working hard to honor the generations who came before us, to build something that matters, that makes a difference, that will last, and that does right by the generations who follow us. I've tried to fight the good fight every single day. 
Brad, let me tell you, I'm sometimes overwhelmed with work and the many commitments of daily life. And I sometimes have to wonder, is this work to preserve a black legacy in one of the whitest states in the nation, too bold, too brash? Is fighting the good fight and pushing for a better Vermont too risky? Is all of this work worth it? Well, yes, definitely it's worth it. And I've always believed it's worth it. And I'm in good company. But let me tell you something else. Like many of you, I have been struggling to stay hopeful and positive in the midst of chaos going on in the world, in our nation, in our very communities. Chaos over the past few years. And just like you, there are times when I feel really, really tired. So it's very important, especially during these times, to come together and to lift up people who are doing good work. Right around this time last year, I was honored to receive the 2021 Con Hogan Award. That experience gave me an extra boost of courage and energy at exactly the time I most needed it. And it's inspired me to keep on going, no matter what new challenges may arise. And they seem to arise every day. The recognition has also brought more visibility and momentum to the work of the nonprofit organization, Clemens Family Farm. Over the past year, my work with Clemens Family Farm has focused on solidifying the nonprofit organization's mission through collaborations with Vermont artists of African descent, with grade schools, and with other nonprofit organizations around the state. With Kia Ray Hanron, Clemens Family Farm's arts learning advisor, our team has developed a beautiful arts integrated African American history curriculum for grades K through 12 called Joy in Motion. The curriculum focuses on joy as a skill for resilience and resistance during challenging times. It helps young people learn U.S. history, hard history, through creative themes of motion, movement, and travel, and through the lens of the African-American experience. In our work in public health over the past year, Clemens Family Farm gathered nearly 40 stories from Black Vermonters who used visual or performing arts to help them share their COVID-19 vaccination experiences in the Beneath Our Skin Storytelling Project funded by the Vermont Department of Health. We've already shared these stories on our website, beneathourskin.org, and we'll soon bring the stories and the artwork directly into Vermont communities through a traveling exhibit that we'll install in four different locations around the state. We are doing this because sharing stories is important, it's healing, and it's a great way to build stronger communities. Clemens Family Farm's creative arts director, Karen Abdul-Malik, has been working with us in new initiatives that bring more of Vermont's Black artists into the creative economy, engaging in positive and empowering relationships with the Vermont communities. For example, after nearly a year's postponement due to the pandemic, Facing the Sunrise, a performing arts series that brings some of Vermont's amazing Black musicians, singers, and spoken word artists to audiences in the Northeast Kingdom, finally launched. And this series is made possible through a joyful collaboration with Catamount Film and Arts. Clemens Family Farm collaborated with the City of Burlington's Department of Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging to, imagine, to manage the call for artisan vendors for Juneteenth celebrations. And we entered into a new partnership with Adventures by Disney to create paid opportunities for eight Vermont artists to share their art and culture with nearly 400 visitors to the Clemens Farm during 10 separate visits. 
Clemens Family Farm is about to release our very first calendar that features 13 artists in our network. The calendar will share beautiful photos and great information about the artists, the farm, and black history to Vermonters at home, at school, and at work. And finally, we were overjoyed to receive notification that Clemens Family Farm is one of the Vermont recipients of a 2022 grant through congressionally directed spending funds mobilized in large part through Senator Patrick Leahy's leadership in Washington, D.C. The grant funds will be used to preserve and improve two historic buildings under lease by the nonprofit on the Clemens Farm for community programs celebrating African-American history, art, and culture. It has been a very busy year. I was thrilled to learn about Mr. Joe Wea and his inspiring work in Brattleboro. Joe, as this year's recipient of the Con Hogan Award, you are probably feeling, I think, the same way I was feeling around this time last year. Surprised, humbled, joyful, grateful, and inspired. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much for your service to Vermont and to us all. Joe, I send you my warmest greetings and well wishes from the farm. Well, thank you, Lydia. That was wonderful. Um, well, now we move on to, uh, I guess, the heart of it. You know, we on the Con Hogan Award Committee are so proud, so proud to present the 2022 Con Hogan Award for Creative Entrepreneurial Community Leadership to Joe Wea, Director of the Ethiopian Community Development Council's Multicultural Community Center in Brattleboro, Vermont. Joey's story is an amazing journey of persistence through setbacks and taking risks in pursuit of a vision. Joe's background includes being a displaced person himself, fleeing from Liberia to Sierra Leone before coming to the U.S. to pursue a, pursue a master's degree at the Vermont School for International Training. Joe has lived in Vermont for a decade, became a U.S. citizen, and now has led our state's response to the world's call by setting up, growing, and leading Southern Vermont's new resettlement agency. When Governor Phil Scott announced Vermont was ready, willing, and able to welcome refugees, the Ethiopian Community Development Council opened Southern Vermont's first refugee resettlement branch office and selected Joe to lead the effort. He met with dozens of community leaders to introduce them to the new resettlement effort and prepare them for the arrival of the first Afghans starting in January of 2022. Working with state, federal, and local officials, as well as community members and private businesses, Joe developed effective partnerships to assist in securing jobs for refugees, temporary housing for the first 100 Afghans and English language classes. Within the first nine months, Joe and his staff, he has assembled at ECDC's Brattleboro Cent uh, Multicultural Center. They've welcomed and resettled 100 Afghan refugees in the area. And following this success, Joe and his team will begin a new phase in which refugees who have been granted asylum and are waiting in camps around the world will be settled in southern Vermont. Joe has effectively reoriented and expanded his staff to match the different way in which this phase of resettlement will be done, with a focus on developing, supporting, and maintaining community-level sponsorship groups who commit to at least one year of support for folks settling in our communities. I now invite Joe up to share his story. Joe, congratulations and welcome.
Thank you, Willie, for those kind words. And thank you also to the Kong Hogan Award Committee. I'm both honored by this recognition and honored to be amongst its past recipients. Before I speak, there are a few others I, may, I must thank. First, I want to say thank you to ECDC and its president, Dr. Sahai, who has given me the opportunity to lead the Vermont office of ECDC. I also want to thank my colleagues from the ECDC office in Brattleboro, our refugees community. You all work so hard, so you are the real recipient of this award. I also want to thank my friends, Karen Mary. Ruben is down here for your support. Of course, I want to thank my partner, Faraja, who stands by me every day and continue to put up with me when I'm complaining. <laughs> I also want to thank my uncle, Dave, who's representing my family here and who flew from Minneapolis to be here. Thank you, Dave, being here. My parents, I also want to thank them. My father, who passed 27 years ago in a refugee camp in the Africa coast. And up, up, and up until now, we do not know where he was buried. Oh, he still remained with us. And I also want to thank my mom, who did not go to school, but from earlier on, understood the value of education and provided me with two choices. She said to me, either you go to school or you stay here in the village to be a farmer like a PS. And I'm proud that she gave me those two choices and I chose one. I also want to thank my oldest brother, Mountain, who may be watching from Liberia right now. As a young man, he stood by us and took the role of our father. I want to thank my children, Joe and Kim. One of the reasons I do what I do every day. And their mom, Fanny, who has been raising them since I left Liberia. And I want to thank you. I want to thank and share this award with all Vermonters, especially those from the South. I want to start with the state office, um, especially Tracy Dolan. I want to thank all volunteer service providers. You all step up, welcome refugees. You have taken refugees resettlement in Southern Vermont from a concept to an action, and I want to thank you all for that. ECDC Vermont Office was established and sustained by those who understand that little things can have a profound effect. These things can have lasting impact not only on those who are the recipient, but those who provide them. I'm sure some of you here heard about the butterfly effect in the chaos theory. The term is closely associated with the work of a mathematician, Edward Lawrence. It is a theory that a butterfly flapping its wings in South America can affect weather pattern halfway around the world. It is essential to the theory that little things can have traumatic effects. That's what I want to talk to you about today. The little things that can make a big difference. I have three little things I will ask of you today. First, I will ask you to educate yourself 
and others about refugees and immigrants in general. And second, I will ask you to listen. And third, I will ask you to react. Educating yourself and others about refugees and immigrants is a way of taking notice of their plights. And for me, knowing the plight came early on in life. I didn't have to educate myself. I experienced it. But for some of us, if you educate yourself about refugees, you will come to realize these are intelligent and creative people whose dreams are no different from ours. Despite my experience and continued education, I might not have understood and discovered their immense talent if I did not listen or educate myself. A lack of education, a lack of educating ourselves can prevent us from seeing the issues that have an enormous impact on people around us. Issues such as the lack of economic opportunities, equal treatment before the law, equal treatment before financial institutions, and many more. When we fail to see these issues, we do the service not only to the immigrants, but to ourselves. Now understanding our new neighbor's plight and helping to address it does not only limit the economic performance of our state, but our companies, our firms, and our economy as a whole. According to the Center of Immigration Studies, as of January 2022, Immigrants or those identified as foreign born, be it legal or illegal, represents 14.2% of our nation's population. This amount to 46.6 million people. Pierre Arenas, Vice President and Senior Economist at the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank, put it this way, when immigrants enter the labor force, they increase the productive capacity of the economy as a whole. She went on to say that 44 percent of medical scientists and foreign born and immigrants accounting and immigrants accounting for 42 percent of computer software developers. Immigrant workers are also overrepresented among college professors, engineers, mathematicians nurses, doctors, and dentists. According to a 2022 report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, immigrants made up approximately 17% of the U.S. civilian workforce. These figures do not account for undocumented immigrants. Breaking that down, immigrants account for 21.2% of the workforce in the service field 15.3% in production, transportation, material moving across the country, and 14.2% in natural resource construction and maintenance. In 2017, Peer Research Center study project that with our immigrants, the overall U.S. workforce would decline by almost 10 million people by 2035. If, break, if you break that down, meaning the Peer Research Institute report, and focus it on Southern Vermont alone, the trend is worrying. And I know it is across the entire state, but for the sake of time, I decided to focus on Southern Vermont. According to Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development, between 2010 and 2030, South in Vermont, Vermont alone will be losing about 20,000 workforce. They broke it down this way. For ages 0 to 19, they were reduced from 18,650 people to 16,072, a net loss of 2,578 people. When you go further to ages 20 and 30, it reduces from 16,833 to 14,609, 
a net loss of 2,274 people. And when you go for ages 6, 14 and 64, it reduces from 31,943 people to 23,663 people at a net loss of 8,280 people from our workforce. On the contrary, for those nearing retirement ages from 65 to 64, the figure grows from 12,116 to 21,105, representing about 8,989 moving into the retirement age. And if you go further, those at 85 will grow from 2,046 to 3,195, representing 1,149 people. This trend tells us we need about 20,000 people entering the workforce to keep current workforce over the same period just in Southern Vermont alone. We currently have less people going into workforce and more getting out. And as Con may have said, if he was still here with us, the numbers do not lie. So beside our humanitarian obligation to help those fleeing, fleeing persecution and crisis, we also have a strong reason why we need more people moving into Vermont. But if you look back at the refugees resettlement in the last 40 years, for our state that is regarded the second least populated state behind Wyoming and the second widest state in America behind Maine, we only resettled an estimated 8,000 refugees, particularly in the Burlington area. To put that number into context, that is about 200 people per year. Why, between 2010 and 2016, the overall out migration of our people of people living in Vermont was 3,892 people? Even though our 2020 census but population grew by just 2.8% over the decade, a net gain of 17,336 people. But if you dig deeper into that gain, you quickly realize the figure is mostly driven by those who are close to retirement or looking for a quiet and environmental friendly state or high skilled workers who can work from home. Our manufacturing, transport, and civic sectors gained little workforce during this period. From the figures provided, refugees coming to Vermont is not only a moral obligation, but an economic survival for our state. So we should continue asking ourselves, what kind of Vermont we want to see? And we have the choice to embrace those fleeing wars, persecution, and natural disasters and turn their misfortune into opportunity for them and for us, or we can sit and watch and do nothing. That brings me to my second ask, that we must listen. Even though my partner Faraja will tell you this is not my greatest attribute. <laughs> but at least I try and I will continue trying. However, the listening I'm asking and speaking about is not only with the ears, but with the heart and the mind. It is that listening that allows for the better understanding. We must listen because it is important. Despite immigrants' contribution to the greatness of our state and nation, historically they have not been heard, seen, or equally represented in our state government. So it is symbolically important we listen. We must listen to understand. We must realize that immigrants look at things through different lens. That's not a flaw or something to be ignored, but, a, but an opportunity for better understanding. Too many of us have not paid attention to the numerous impediments facing immigrants. And it starts when we open to dialogue either as a group or individuals. The important thing that is, is that we start talking, and more importantly, we start listening. But we also must literally listen. 
For those insults that immigrants sometimes deal, insults such as they like free stuff, they do not share our values, they do not speak English, they do not like us. Or you should go back to your country. Those presumptive questions sometimes we ask on our dining tables. Why are they not appreciating all we have done for them? I know this anti-immigrant rhetoric has no place in society and should not have a place in Vermont. Much less a state and people that builds its foundation on liberalism, justice, freedom, ethics, and civility. We should ask ourselves if we, are on the other, if we were on the other side. Will we put up with that for a second? I doubt we will not. Yet for years, and sometimes sadly today, immigrants have faced a barrage of these insults, and for time and again, for the sake of a better life, they responded with a dignified restraint. We must listen, and then we must act. We must react to our systems that need re-examination. Systems that are embedded with institutional bias. And sometimes we reward, reward people on the basis of the color of their skin, the places we were born, and the way we speak, then the value we create. We must react without fear. For too many times we have become victims of our own doubts. Sometimes to the belief that increase in immigration puts a greater burden on our, on our economy and way of life. But that zero-sum mentality is simply not true. In fact, studies have shown the opposite, that the United States benefit from immigration. We must react because of the promises our nation made. Give me your tired, your poor, your heart of masses yearning for breath to breathe free. We cannot with credibility perpetuate this principle on other people unless we correct this, the inadequacy in our systems. Friends, it is critical that we should react to correct our system and then we lead others to do the same. Now let me turn to the immigrant community. Those here or those listening through social media, I ask you to engage, inspire, and persevere. If ever we should change the system and embrace our new home, we must engage and persuade our native-born neighbors to be involved in the conversation. Your native-born neighbors are not the enemy. In fact, their inclusion is a prerequisite to the sources of meaningful immigration system in our state and nation. So I challenge all of you to return and engage at least one native born in when you get back. The key is to engage in honest dialogue in a safe place to expand your horizon, your belief system, while educating them on your own. In this way, you can both become agents of change. If you truly believe there is a need for improvement at all levels of our system, you must boldly believe, you must boldly be willing to engage those on the other side of it. I ask you to inspire. Inspire your fellow immigrants, those here or those to come after you. You are the ambassadors of Vermont to, to those to come. I believe, I, I believe no matter who you are, you can be an inspiration by your accomplishments, your careers, and the little things you do every day. So never focus so much on the fact that the system as it is now are not in your best interest, that you lose sight of the incredible opportunities that this nation and, and this beautiful state offers. Finally, I ask you to persevere 
persevere to recruit more immigrants to come to Vermont despite the slow progress we have made. Persevere takes courage, humility, diligence, and passion. It takes strength of characters and sincerity of convictions. So you may ask, how can that classify as such a little thing? Or classify that as a little thing? Well, when I think of it, I don't think of you. I think of those who came before us. Albert Einstein, one of the physicists, was a refugee. Sachi Bryan, co-founder of Google. Levi Strauss, the Levi Jeans. Uh, Dikombe Motumbo, one of the greatest basketball players. Madeleine Albright, U US, former US uh, Secretary of State and former US Ambassador to the United Nations. Jane Cohn, who started off as a cleaner in a grocery store but co-founder was up. Steve Chin, co-founder of YouTube. Why these are people we notice? There are so many immigrants you do not hear about, but continue to do those little things that are changing lives. When I think about them and many others that came before them, I imagine them standing before a tall mountain to climb. A mountain so tall that they cannot see the, others, cannot see the top. And while they cannot see the top, they also can see what is on the other side. But they knew on this other side of that mountain, there is an opportunity. These people had two choices. They could turn and go back and not climb, or they could start climbing. They chose to climb not because it was easy, but with the hope they would reach the top and come out on the other side. But many of them also knew they wouldn't get to the top or the other side but they persevere with the hope that others will come behind them and pick up from where they stopped. And as they did, the climb became easier. That's part of the obstacle they faced. They were undeterred and unrelenting to climb. We celebrate them today not because they were not of doubts or failures, but because they kept climbing. That, my friend, is persevering at the highest order. And by comparison, what I ask of you today is a little thing. So I want to put all this together by telling you the little things in my life. In recent times, I had a conversation with my children who I haven't been living with for the past nine years. And I told them I would be traveling to Liberia soon. And from their reaction and seeing how they reacted, caused me a lot of reflection. They could have chosen to be angry with me for leaving them all these years, but they chose the opposite. And from talking with them, then I realized I spent much of my time ascending that mountain looking for the world I can conquer. But as I approach the top, I think about a world that I can leave behind for them. Make no mistake. I don't think I will have any long-lasting effect on this world. In fact, most of us here, our names will not echo through our history. But what I do believe is that our everyday words and actions might just be. Through our everyday actions, we can have a measurable effect on the future. Little things like how we treat someone with equality, inclusion and acceptance, can dramatically alter their outlook thereby creating that butterfly effect. Even if we are not here to change the world, we can endeavor to change the world in which we live. And most of us in this room and those watching or listening, that world will be spent largely in the little things we do. Someday, when we look back on that mountain that we climbed, and let us know we did a little things that made a bigger difference. And we created a better place for immigrants, state, and country. Thank you.
Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Listen, act without fear, engage and persevere. Climb that mountain. You know, this award is a celebration of leadership in Vermont and Joe Wea and each of our past awardees exemplify how the leadership of one person can overcome challenges, forge paths forward and make Vermont and our communities better, more vibrant places. I want to thank Khan's family here today and for your ongoing support of this award that calls attention to the efforts by Vermonters to serve the public good. Thank all of you for taking the time to join us tonight to provide your support of this year's Khan Hogan Award winner. And we look forward to next year and hope that you'll help us spread the word when we announce the request for nominations that'll go out next May. Um, for those participating virtually, thank you. For those here in person, thank you. And please join us together with Joe for more refreshments and fellowship. And we also, we've got a lot of food, so we have take home boxes. If anyone, there's no need to leave any of our food to waste. Uh, so if you can't eat it all here, take it home with you. But thank you all. And congratulations again, Joe. <laughs>